Hello, my name is Daniel Olivia, and I work at Engineering at MinIO. I'm going to give you a brief demo of the MinIO operator. Operator is our open source uh, orchestration implementation based on the operator pattern uh, for Kubernetes. The whole idea being that you can attach a lot of high density hard disk drives, very high speed uh, solid state drives, or insanely ultra fast no uh, NVMe drives uh, to your Kubernetes nodes. And on top of, and then by providing them uh, as persistent volumes to MinIO, you can build very large high performance object storage clusters. The whole idea is that MinIO operator will provide you enough with enough tools for you to provision separate tenants with different capabilities. For example, you could have a tenant that is running an extremely fast NVMe memory and another tenant that needs some more capacity, but maybe not at the same type of storage as an NVMe st storage class. And both of these tenants could be properly running with separate configurations of storage, as well as MinIO and encryption requirements if need be. So the easiest way to install operator is by running kubectl apply k against our GitHub repository. Additionally, you could specify a release build. So you, you can freeze this in your pipelines and deploy specifically the version of our operator that you're expecting. So what I have here, it's a Kubernetes cluster that has no MinIO operator installed in it. Right, so what I'm gonna do first is just call kubectl apply k against our repository and I'm gonna reference a specific release of our operator. This in, this in turn is gonna have kubectl itself apply uh, the, all the necessary resources uh, to your Kubernetes cluster, which in turn will generate uh, install a MinIO operator namespace, as you can see here. If I were to explore what's inside this Kubernetes namespace, you'll see that the pods for our operator is already up and running. It's that simple. Creating a tenant. Pro provi provisioning object storage cluster is never been easier. So we, the definition of a tenant is comprised of uh, basically six parts, right? So you, you need to define a resource with our API and kind. You need to define a tenant name. And then you get down to the sound de the definition, which must specify how many pods you want, the configuration for your volume. This is useful if you are trying to leverage uh, volume affinity, right? Uh, so that you can leverage persistent local volumes on each of the nodes. Lastly, it's capacity and the number of volumes per server. This will allow you to uh, very easily define new tenants, each one with different storage capabilities. So what I have here, it's a tenant definition. It, it's pretty much taken off our, of our GitHub repository examples folder, and you'll see a couple of secrets to define the root credentials for my tenant, and as well as my tenant definition. In this tenant definition, I'm just creating a tenant called tenant A that has turned on some console management interface. Uh, I'm passing down the credentials for my MinIO. If I'm also specifying a specific MinIO release. Uh, th this is how you can actually uh, freeze the image that you're using for your tenant. And I'm also configuring request auto cert, so TLS certificates will be requested for me. And la lastly, it's configuring a zone of four servers with four drives, each drive of 20 gigabytes. So let's apply this to Jammer. All right. So after applying this tenant, well, the, the way I can check the status by actually doing kubectl get tenants and, and checking on the state of my tenant. The first thing we did is we started requesting TLS certificates by leveling the certificate tenant request inside the Kubernetes. After a couple of minutes, you'll see uh, the tenant requesting for waiting for the pods to be ready. If I were to check on the pod status, I would see all my pods up and running for up to a minute. This will give enough time for the pods to come up and, uh, and discover each other. And finally, you will see roughly after three minutes, my, my tenant is properly initialized. Now I'm ready to start consuming object storage. To consume object storage by your applications is a piece of cake. Any S3 compatible application uh, just needs to reference the internal service endpoint that, that we deploy with, along with every tenant on every namespace. This will be comprised by the schema of the, uh, 
whether you if you deploy with the request auto cert, um, the, uh, all the communication will be encrypted behind TLS. If you chose to turn it off, uh, then you just uh, fall back back to HTTP, right? So the MinIO service is static. Uh, every namespace we have it, and all, we only allow one tenant per namespace. And lastly, the namespace, right? So this goes before the fully qualified uh, domain name inside Kubernetes cluster, and that's that's pretty much it. So if you have any fully S3 compatible applications, for example, if you were configuring some hardware through the home chart, you could start referencing MinIO via this URL. If you have some Spark environment, you could also just start referencing MinIO or them as well through some Spark TensorFlow application. These are just some examples of uh, standard app open source applications that have support for object storage, and they need no change whatsoever to the con owner need to start working with MinIO. Consuming object storage by humans is just as easy. Along with the deployment of the object storage cluster, we deployed our object browser, which is a tool that allows you to browse the bucket and its contents through a, brow a browser. And additionally, we deployed our administration console, which is the MinIO console. So I recommend you give those a try. And that's it for us today. You can join us on our Slack, come, come down to chat with us on our GitHub, check out our source code, on our website to download our latest banneries. You can check our documentation or see our blog post over here. So my name again is Daniel Bodivia. Thank you for your time.